All right. Good morning. <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, welcome again, as is the case every other week, to the uh, AMS System Sports Ultrasound case series. Um, I am super excited um, for our talk today. Um, we've got Dr. Brennan Betcher. He is a uh, PM&R and sports medicine doc at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's an instructor in physical medicine rehabilitation. He's the associate program director of the Sports Medicine Fellowship. Uh, the majority of Dr. Brennan's clinical practice is dedicated to the management of acute and chronic sports injuries, diagnostic ultrasound, and minimally invasive ultrasound guided procedures to the treatment of acute and chronic musculoskeletal conditions. I've known Brennan for a exceptionally long time, and he's probably one of the best ultrasound um, or ultrasonographers that I know. So I, I know that this talk is going to be nothing short of of fantastic. So looking forward to it. Brennan, I'll let you rock and roll. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Let's see. Um, you shouldn't have set the bar so high uh, early on because the only way to go from there is down. Um, but, but thanks again, uh, Ryan and uh, Doug for having me. And, uh, and, and taking this case series uh, uh, forward as far as you guys have, it's been great. Um, I have uh, no disclosures. Uh, these are my objectives. There's a lot to get through here for the medial ankle, and so I'm going to kind of move forward quickly through the case history so we uh, can spend some time on the anatomy. Um, this is a 65-year-old uh, female who presents with uh, left foot and ankle pain. It's been a couple of years in the making after an injury abroad uh, and then some hiking. Um, she describes a stabbing and burning in the medial ankle, six to eight out of ten. She endorses some swelling, occasional redness. Uh, she's tried several different treatments, all which have provided her uh, minimal benefit. And she actually presents um, uh, to the clinic uh, wondering about uh, diagnosis and then also a uh, treatment plan. On examination, she has uh, normal sensation. She has a uh, too many toes sign, slightly intelligent gait. She has uh, asymmetric pes planus, uh, some hind foot valgus. She's unable to do a single leg heel raise, um, a single leg heel raise on that foot, uh, but she can on the other side. She does not have a rigid midfoot um, with passive motion. She has normal strength, uh, with the exception of resisted inversion. That also gives her some pain. Um, passive eversion also gives her some pain. She has tenderness over the course of the posterior tibialis uh, tendon. She has mild asymmetric swelling in the intramalleolar region um, over the course of the posterior tibialis. Um, on other testing, she uh, has a soft endpoint with anterior drawer, a little bit of increased translation. Uh, she has a negative uh, midfoot shock testing, and then she has some hypertrophy changes around the uh, great toe MTP joint. She arrived with non-weight bearing films, um, so we we did repeat that. We got some weight bearing films. I didn't include her foot films on here, um, uh, but if you look at at this, uh, she has a little bit of um, pes planus. Her uh, calcaneal inclination angle is a little bit low as well. I don't have that measured on here. Uh, but I think it was around, uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe around like 14 or 15. Um, and you can see that uh, her uh, kind of uh, the line bisecting her talus to her first metatarsal uh, does dive plantar to the first metatarsal. So some radiographic findings of that pes planus. Um, the whole purpose of this case series is really to go through, you know, how do you approach a, a particular clinical scenario? and perform a complete uh, diagnostic ultrasound uh, on that patient. And so that's really what we're gonna focus on is making sure we get through that complete uh, examination. Um, these are just what are required for a limited and complete uh, based on CMS uh, guidelines. And so I just include these uh, for reference. The ankle protocol um, includes several required and uh, several optional structures for the medial ankle. I would argue that we probably ought to uh, have a joint over in this required um, section in order to meet, you know, the, the CMS requirements of having uh, some sort of joint uh, included there. All right, so I'm just going to jump right into it. And, and I typically try and approach my um, regional scans in a, a similar sort of uh, fashion every time. And so I like to image structures uh, in a particular sequence to try and make sure I'm not skipping over things, uh, getting excited when I see pathology and then and then failing to diagnose other things that would have been appropriate to scan. So I typically start my medial ankle scan with a visualization of the tibial nerves. You're gonna see that here um, and it's gonna kind of swing through quickly. So as we come from proximal to distal and you can see the transducer orientation on the left side there, 
you're going to see that tibial nerve come deep to the artery there and uh, and head uh, inferior and posterior. And what you'll also notice uh, in this region, kind of right through here, is you're going to find some posterior um, acoustic enhancement to that tibial nerve as it sits below the artery here. And so just pay attention to that. I'll then trace that out into the bifurcations of the medial and lateral plantar nerve. So this is uh, in the sulcus for the FHL within the calcaneus. And so you'll see that medial plantar nerve and that lateral plantar nerve as they divide and, uh, and start to diverge. I'll then follow the medial plantar nerve as it courses uh, through the midfoot. So uh, this uh, pink structure right here. And so you're going to see that medial plantar nerve uh, start to come across. It's going to cross over the top right here of the FHL down deep and the FDL superficially. And so we're going to trace that nerve uh, as it courses through that region. So that's kind of the, the main uh, location we're going to look for pathology in that medial plantar nerve uh, is kind of in the region of this master knot of Henry. And we'll cover that a little bit more um, uh, a little bit later. And then we're also just gonna you know, pay attention to where it runs from a plane standpoint. So it's gonna run between the abductor halysis muscles superficially and uh, those tendons that I just covered uh, deep. And so um, one thing I'll mention is as I'm talking, I will sometimes say that something like the medial plantar nerve here would be um, superficial, and that's in reference to the skin. Um, however, it is also uh, plantar, which is in reference, you know, anatomically to the body. And so, so those things uh, would mean the same in this particular uh, body region is that that nerve would sit plantar, but it's also actually superficial, which some, seems a little bit um, counterintuitive sometimes until you think about it. We'll then follow the lateral plantar nerve because it courses across the midfoot. Um, one thing to note is that sometimes that uh, um, that lateral plantar nerve can uh, get a little bit of edge shadowing from the uh, FDB muscle. And so sometimes you actually need to trace it into the midfoot and actually find it um, when it's underneath the center of the FDB muscle. And then uh, sometimes you can trace it back from there and get a little bit better visualization. And so um, as we come across here, you'll notice initially that that lateral plantar nerve is a little bit difficult to visualize in this region. But then as we get into the midfoot, you can see that nerve clearly uh, below the muscle and heading across uh, the midfoot. And then so if you want to, you can just trace it backwards and uh, a little bit more clearly visualize where it is in reference uh, to the uh, AH and the FDB muscles um, in this region. So far, um, you know, the structures that I've looked at have looked relatively normal to me. And so um, when I'm commenting and thinking about what I just saw for the, basically for the neurovascular structures, I didn't see anything abnormal with the vasculature and I didn't comment too specifically on that, um, but they were uh, compressible, patent and without significant calcifications. Uh, when I look at the nerves, the nerves also were normal um, in caliber, they were normal in aquatexture, they had a normal uh, appearance. Um, however, you know, I will comment that the medial plantar nerve uh, traversed over, um, you know, a large uh, fusion in the region, the master knot of Henry, and we'll look at that region a little bit more in detail later. But, you know, that's theoretically could contribute to some compression, compression of the medial plantar nerve. Now, this patient had no symptoms when I pressed on that area, so she had no reproduction of her typical symptoms with palpating the nerve in this region uh, when localized with ultrasound. And uh, she also had no um, caliber or acrotexture changes within the nerve. And so I you know, will comment that that theoretically could contribute to some medial plantar nerve compression, but that was not apparent uh, in today's scan. Next, I'll, I'll look at kind of the, the tarsal tunnel. So that flexor retina activum is gonna cross over um, the neurovascular structures and then also uh, the musculotendinous structures in the medial ankle and forms a tarsal tunnel. So. In this region, I'll get a little bit oblique off of the medial malleolus, uh, as is indicated here, um, heading down towards that posterior calcaneus. And I'll find the structure that is crossing uh, somewhat obliquely and perpendicular uh, to the posterior tibialis and the flexor digitum longus. So, so this right here is a flexor retinaculum. You can see the fibers uh, clearly running over the top, and it is tensioned appropriately. This is something that can be scanned dynamically, so you can have uh, people circumdeck or uh, dorsiflex and plantar flex, and you can assess for whether there's any subluxation of the posterior uh, tibialis over that medial malleolus. 
Uh, one thing to note as you uh, do scan kind of more towards the calcaneus is that medial calcaneal branch uh, runs uh, superficial to this. And that's also helpful uh, if you're if you're trying to identify uh, that versus like Baxter's nerve, for example. After that, I'll move on to the posterior tibialis and then I'll kind of just march backwards. And so um, I typically start by identifying the posterior tibialis at the level of medial malleolus. And so it should be the tendon that sits uh, in uh, closest proximity to the uh, posterior medial tibia. Then I'll typically trace that proximally into the muscle belly and just take a look if, if whether um, there's any significant uh, denervation changes or fibro fatty infiltration within the muscle. And then I will um, also trace it distally uh, all the way down to its uh, insertion on the navicular and also uh, into the medial cuneiform uh, if it's uh, easily visualized. You'll note that this is going to pass deep to the flexor retinaculum. Uh, and like I mentioned, you can do the dynamic uh, testing to evaluate for whether there's any subluxation. So here we're going to find that posterior tibialis and we're going to trace it distally. Immediately um, with this particular individual, you'll note that there is a fair amount of um, hypertrophic, uh, hypoechoic uh, tissue in the peritendinous region that involves both the flexor digitorum longus as well as the posterior tibialis. You'll also see that the posterior tibialis is relatively enlarged in this region and has relatively heterogeneous echotexture. So there are regions that are relatively hyperechoic, there are regions that are uh, closer to anechoic, and then there are regions that are somewhere in between. And sometimes that can be due to anisotropy. So we're imaging a curved uh, structure around a relatively uh, bony prominence, so it can be somewhat difficult. Um, but just uh, paying attention to that equitexture as you scan back and forth and how that changes uh, as you go from proximal to distal. So uh, my initial thoughts are that this individual is, you know, has some posterior to the alus uh, tenosynovitis and synovial hypertrophy that also affects the flexor to term longus. And there are some equitexture changes within the posterior tibialis. So now I know I need to spend a little bit more time uh, scanning the posterior tibialis. So I'm going to follow the tendon now a little bit deeper in the inframalleolar region. And so now we're kind of tracing it around um, into the uh, more kind of plantar uh, medial um, and midfoot hindfoot region. And so once again, you note that that uh, posterior tibialis really becomes quite enlarged, quite heterogeneous. So you have some real focal anechoic regions in the posterior. There are some uh, clefts that are running uh, through the tendon here and uh, is, is substantially enlarged in this region. There uh, continues to be uh, synovial hypertrophy and uh, hypoarchogenicity in this region that is now, I would say, relatively preferentially affecting the posterior tibialis compared to the flexor digitorum longus. So now I'll switch to a um, longitudinal or long axis view of the posterior tibialis. And so at this point, I will oftentimes start to do some dynamic testing to see if there's any diastasis. And so typically, um, these this pathology in the posterior tibialis is going to be these kind of longitudinal split tears. But you can see more transverse tears and high grade tears that actually do uh, display diastasis as well. And so I will usually start kind of right along that posterior medial tibia, and then I will try and stay long on the tendon as I either passively or actively um, move that tendon, or sorry, if I uh, passively or the patient actively moves that tendon. And so you'll kind of slide on and off, but what I see here is relatively uh, symmetric caliber of the proximal tendon with some hypoectogenicity, um, a little bit more superficial. As I uh, scan right to the bottom of the tibia here, you'll see that tendon almost has appearance of two tendons now where there's a substantially thickened and hypoechoic and divergent tendon superficially and a slightly more normal appearing uh, tendon deep. As I stress this, you see the tendon uh, is tensioning. There's no evidence of uh, you know, transverse or um, um, tears across the fibers of the tendon or significant tearing across the fibers of the tendon. This just highlights that a little bit better. So you see kind of the, the fibular pattern of that tendon coming down. And as you get to this point right here in that kind of intramedial tibia, you see that those superficial fibers really start to diverge and become quite, um, they become quite less uh, conspicuous where the deeper fibers are uh, relatively well-preserved uh, still at this level. And so you can see there's kind of some preferential effect of a portion of the tendon. 
my little uh, animations are apparently not functioning, which is all right. Um, after that, I'm going to um, turn on some uh, power Doppler uh, to take a look at what sort of uh, hypervascularity is in the tendon and around the tendon. And so you'll notice um, I keep trying to lay off as much pressure as I can. So sometimes you'll lose part of the visualization of the tendon as you try and um, reduce your uh, compression of that hypervascularity with your transducer pressure. And so oftentimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll try and uh, do a little bit of a gel standoff or um, add a little bit more gel and uh, minimize that. And so I've switched here. Now I have a large gel standoff to try and minimize uh, any compression I have. And so you can see some of that fluid collecting around the tendon and the hypervascularity. As I move, you'll see artifact flashing on and off. Um, but once I'm stationary, you'll see the hypervascularity remains around the tendon. Um, and so just commenting on, you know, what I've seen in the posterior tibialis here. So, you know, this is a tendon that is uh, substantially thickened and hypoechoic. There is uh, partial thickness uh, tearing within the tendon. There's uh, no evidence of a, you know, transection or a complete tear with any diastasis. There's also uh, tenosynovitis, so there's synovial hypertrophy. There's an effusion, uh, which was not substantial, but is uh, present. And there's uh, plenty of hyperemia on power Doppler imaging. Next, I'll move to the spring ligament. And so with the spring ligament, um, this is kind of a, actually a, a confluence of a couple of ligaments, but typically you can get a pretty good visualization uh, between the calcaneus and the navicular um, at the level of the talus here. And so this is kind of uh, a little bit on the plantar, but a little bit on the medial aspect of the foot. And so you're kind of across right here, that's that green uh, structure highlighted here. And it can be a little bit difficult to get a good image of this because uh, when the patient is, um, you know, just resting, this ligament is oftentimes not tensioned well, and so you get some anisotropy. And so I tend to like to put people into some forefoot abduction to try and um, tension this ligament a little bit, and then to evaluate the function. And if you remember, you know, the function of the spring ligament is essentially uh, to um, connect the calcaneus and navicular and prevent uh, plantar translation of the talus. So this is the calcaneus on the left. The navicular is on the right. This is a talus right here. And so as uh, as people wait there, the spring ligament essentially functions to prevent this talus from dropping. And uh, when I stress this individual, you can see that that spring ligament is essentially uh, intact, but completely incompetent. And so I can easily uh, produce quite a bit of diastasis between those two structures. And you can see this talus um, it looks like it's rising superficial, but my transducer is kind of on the plantar medial aspect of the foot. So really what is happening is as I passively um, stress this ligament, the talus is actually dropping plantar. And that's one of the findings that we see um, with progressive uh, acquired flat foot deformity is that talus uh, dropping plantar. And so we already see that this individual, in addition to the posterior tibialis tendinopathy, uh, has a pretty incompetent spring uh, ligament. After that, I will uh, move on to the other tendons in the medial ankle. So we're going to look at the flexor de longus. I like to, uh, you know, once again, scan up into the muscle belly and then down uh, into the into the midfoot and kind of towards the forefoot. So once it gets to the metatarsals, I tend to stop scanning this uh, if it's primarily a medial ankle protocol. You want to get uh, short and long axis views um, proximally, but you also really want to look at that FDL, FHL intersection. And so we'll spend some time uh, there. And so here we're going to scan um, from the posterior medial ankle, so the tibia here. We're gonna come down and that flexor digitorum longus is gonna uh, diverge from the posterior tibialis and pass over the sustentaculum pali of the calcaneus uh, before it progresses into the foot and crosses over the uh, FHL. And so um, we've seen that. Now we're gonna look at that flexor digitorum longus um, kind of in the midfoot and short and long axis views. And sorry, let me just comment one more thing on this video here. As, as we follow this in, this is uh, going to be a very similar picture to what I showed you when I was looking at the medial plantar nerve, where you have the uh, flexor hallucis longus deep, the flexor digitorum longus uh, superficial, and then the medial plantar nerve is going to sit on top. And so this is kind of the area that we're looking uh, for that kind of uh, intersection in the foot of that FHL and FDL. And what you see here is you see a lot of synovial hypertrophy. You see a large anechoic fluid collection that primarily surrounds the FHL, but also involves the FDL. Um, and so we're going to look at that a little bit uh, closer now. 
we're going to look at the tendon uh, architecture itself. And so despite a lot of fluid in this area, the tendon actually doesn't look too bad. The fibers are um, nice and echogenic. There's no divergence. There's no significant hypoechogenicity or enlargement. And so just labeling those structures that I was on before. So we have uh, that FHL deep, the FDL superficial, the medial plantar nerve uh, is sitting here. These all sit under the abductor halysis. And then you see highlighted in light blue here is all this fluid uh, through this region. Then we're gonna look um, at a long axis view. So this is gonna be the flexor digitorum longus in long axis crossing over the abductor halysis here, which is uh, in a somewhat oblique orientation. I don't know why these all have animations. They're not supposed to. Uh, once again, just highlighting the different structures here. This is just a little bit further into the foot. All right, so then we're going to look at the FHL. So the, with the FHL, I tend to start um, once again looking at the muscle belly, which is uh, usually a more distal muscle belly than the FDL and the posterior tibialis. I'll evaluate that in short axis and long axis to the posterior ankle, uh, dynamically looking for any evidence of tearing or diastasis. And then I'll also look at short and long axis in that FDL, FHL region. And so as we scan down, you'll see that the FDL um, and the posterior tibialis are anterior here. And the FHL is going to be this large muscle belly here that sits kind of adjacent to the tibial nerve. And as we come down and cross uh, the posterior subtalar joint, we're going to get onto the sulcus within the calcaneus for the FHL, which is just posterior to the sustentaculum pali. And then we're going to follow that down into the foot. And so we can kind of wrap that entire uh, tendon around. Um, let's see. So this is just, uh, you know, a proximal image. So they're showing that FHL muscle belly compared to the FDL, posterior tibialis and tibial nerve. And then distal uh, at the level of the calcaneus where you have the FHL uh, with some fluid around it, the lateral medial plantar nerves, FDL and posterior tibialis uh, more anterior. And this, uh, there's also, if, if you've noticed it in some of the images, just some subcutaneous edema that I've circled up here that is, uh, you know, maybe or maybe not uh, related to her uh, current problem. Then I'll look at the uh, FHL long axis. So this is uh, over the subhalar joint. So you once again see some fluid uh, around the tendon, uh, both proximally and distally. The tendon is starting to wrap around, so you kind of lose the end of it uh, here. I'll do the same thing uh, slightly distal. So just distal to the calcaneus, I'll look at that FHL and long axis. Now we have the FHL long with the FDL uh, crossing obliquely in some fluid uh, outlined in blue here around that area. All right, then I'll oftentimes uh, turn to some dynamic testing. So this is just uh, same level as that last image with the calcaneus here. And I'll just passively extend and flex the great toe, uh, looking to see if that uh, tendon has kind of normal excursion. Uh, if there's any evidence of significant adhesions in that area or uh, any evidence of uh, hydrate tearing. Next, uh, I will add in the medial subhalar joint. So just adjacent to the uh, sustentaculum pali is uh, this uh, little um, break in the hyperechoic cortex. And so this is the subhalar joint here. And so if you need to access that medial subhalar joint, if you're looking for any cortical irregularities around, around the joint or any effusion, uh, you can find that here. I'll look at the uh, delta ligament uh, to some degree. And so for the posterior tibiotalar ligament, uh, you can visualize that kind of deep to the uh, posterior tibialis and FDL. And then uh, the tibiocalcaneal portions is a little bit longer. And so sometimes you can uh, image this in multiple views. And so coming off the tibia, you can visualize that proximally. And then uh, inserting on the sustentaculum pali, you know, just adjacent to the FDL tendon, you can see that distal portion. Uh, and once again, this is a ligament that you can stress. I don't think I've taken videos of that. 
Um, you can look at the anterior tibio-talar and the tibio-navicular uh, ligaments. And so the tibio-talar ligament is going to run over the cartilage of the talus and insert distally. And then the tibio-navicular is going to sit superficial to that. So some differential uh, motion can, can help uh, identify uh, those two ligaments. And so looking at that tibio-talar, you can stress it and, and see that that is um, tensioning appropriately. And then uh, with the tibio-navicular uh, um, the distance here is too great to include it all in one picture, but you can see that distal tibio-navicular ligament uh, tensioning. This is actually the talus here. Sorry, the navicular is to the right of the screen here. All right, and so now I've uh, completed kind of the relevant portions of, of my uh, scan, including the required structures uh, and anything else that I felt was appropriate based on her clinical presentation. And so now it's time to uh, prepare your report. And so, you know, a good ultrasound report should have, uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, information, ordering provider, who did it, where you are, uh, contact information, uh, the clinical history, if it is relevant, uh, anatomic location, the indication, any comparison studies you used, um, what you imaged it on, what your findings, impression, uh, follow-up plans are, and then uh, where that uh, image is archived. And so I typically uh, start my report, you know, just noting the patient who um, ordered it, who was uh, performing, who was reading, uh, where the location is, um, the clinic, and uh, the specific the building that we are in. Um, I include our uh, contact information and when the report was prepared. Um, if this is purely a diagnostic ultrasound, I'll typically include some relevant uh, clinical history. However, this is a patient that I actually did a consult on as well. And so I had a separate uh, full consult note on this patient. And so I will oftentimes refer people to my consultation note for uh, more detailed clinical history if I've done that as well. I'll include the location, so the medial ankle, her indication, you know, she had pain and she had dysfunction uh, of her um, plantar flexors. Um, I'll include comparison, so we had a couple of radiographs that we used for comparison, and then uh, the machine and transducer that I used for the scan. Um, everyone has a different style on how they like to um, organize their ultrasound reports, and I tend to organize mine uh, by anatomic structure. Um, however, some people will organize it in a paragraph uh, fashion. Some people will do a list. I don't think that there's uh, always a right or a wrong way to do it. This is just what I found uh, helpful for me to make sure I'm including the things that I need to include and uh, that I'm not skipping something. And it makes it easier for me when I go back and review it in the future uh, to find what I want. And so for her, you know, noting that the tibial nerve is normal, the medial plantar, plantar nerves are normal. Uh, however, you know, there is this region that could contribute to plantar nerve irritation. I like to include uh, the correlation. So, you know, she didn't have any, um, any uh, findings uh, on um, the ultrasound that would include nerve enlargement, even though, you know, she had that uh, possibility uh, based on the, the current um, imaging. I'll look at her FHL. So her FHL is normal. There's a large uh, fluid collection within the tendon sheath. Um, you know, most notably at the master out of Henry, there's some alveolar hypertrophy. Uh, she had no tenderness over this. And so I like to include that despite the fact that there was something abnormal, it did not hurt where I pressed on that or when we tested that. Um, I'll look at the flexor digitorum longus and, you know, that's normal in caliber, normal in echogenicity. There's a uh, fusion, there's a synovitis uh, noted. There's some uh, osseous peaking at the um, subsyntactyl cali, but Um, and so I'll, I'll note that as well. Um, there are some subtle uh, osseous changes at the uh, medial subpalar joint, uh, and I actually looked at the lateral subpalar joint as well, um, the posterior um, aspect of the lateral subpalar joint, and, and that was also uh, present. I didn't include that on here, uh, but there's no fusion. Um, I noted the delta ligament uh, with stressing of the tibiocalcaneal. I had some attenuation, but it was uh, overall intact. Uh, the spring ligament was intact. However, it had laxity. Um, the talus is noted to have plantar translation uh, with uh, spring ligament dysfunction, so my clinical correlation. And there's no uh, defects noted within the ligament. Uh, within the posterior tibialis, that's kind of where I'll focus things. So uh, there's significant tenosynovial hypertrophy. Uh, there's tendinopathy. There are uh, focal anechoic clefts. And so these are all suggestive of tendinopathy, partial thickness tearing, uh, tenosynovitis. Um, and then I'll also you know, I took a look at the uh, tibia Taylor joint. I didn't include that on uh, images here, but she had some thinning of the Taylor bone cartilage. She had no effusion. I'll clinically uh, put all of that together and so make my report of advanced tenopathy, um, 
of the uh, closer trivialis with associated spring ligament dysfunction, and then uh, the other findings uh, that I mentioned. Um, I'm just, uh, I'll open up for questions one second. I know I'm running a minute over here, but just to take a look at, you know, some of the other findings that you can see. And so when you're looking at the posterior tibialis, um, you know, when you're looking for like full thickness tears, you can definitely see those. So as you trace a tendon down, you'll see that that tendon disappears into nothing and then you just have an empty sheet. And so that's what you're looking for with kind of these full thickness tears is that there's just an empty sheet there with fluid. And then now you see the tendon distally again. Um, and so, you know, just from a comparative standpoint, that's what you're looking for with those full thickness tears. All right, I will um, end there and open it up for any questions. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes over here. Thanks, Brennan. Um, as expected, that was that was fantastic. Your, I mean, your images are are absolutely incredible. Um, they they're just they're they're great. So kudos to you and great job with that. Um, I I honestly don't have a lot. You you pretty much covered everything and made even more comments than I can even think of. Um, so, so great job. I will just make a, a few points or I guess, uh, reiterate some of the things that, that you said, you know, I think our, our, my protocol is pretty much the exact same as yours. I don't spend all that much time on the deltoid unless clinically, I think it's relevant. Um, but other than that, we, we pretty much do the same thing, um, from an ultrasound report stand, um, uh, uh standpoint, we do fairly similar reports as well. I organize mine. Um, like you do with somewhat of a prose uh, description of the findings um, um, organized by the various structures and then bulleted points at the end with the um, with the summary of, of the findings. Um, we've said this before and you made a point on this, but I do think it's important to, to bring this up again. You know, the importance of commenting on pain with sonal palpation over any particular structure I think is really important. Um, we see as you know, all the time that people can have pain with normal appearing structures. And oftentimes we'll see asymptomatic pathology. And so I think correlating pathology with pain in that region is, is really important, and especially for some of the referring providers, um, because they're obviously not in the room with you. And so, you know, letting them know that, yes, there's, you know, fluid or some tendinosis or whatever, but there's no pain in that region, I think, in can be really helpful for folks that are that are sending people over for a diagnostic scan. Um, radiographs for me, as I've mentioned before, are exceptionally important, especially in this area. You know, there are various accessory ossicles down here uh, that can sometimes store you for a loop. So I always make sure I've got radiographs. Um, and then the last thing, just to reiterate, you know, this the the distal tendon doesn't look like the more proximal tendons. There's different morphologies depending on where you are at along this tendon, as the tendon courses distally um, and gets towards its insertion on the navicular, like I think you mentioned, it starts to you know, broaden and, and flatten out and really does insert fairly far plantar medial. Um, so just something to keep in mind as you are following uh, this tendon down um, and just realizing that the echo texture is probably gonna be a bit different than, um, than you would see in the uh, retromedular groove. Um, I think that's all I have. Uh, Doug, do you want to make some comments? Yeah, well, first of all, Brennan, thanks for making the bar so high. Great for all of us to follow you. Um, perfectly done, and I agree with those images. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about protocols, and, and I think you did this. Um, I usually start my protocol with an anterior ankle with the talocrural joint, um, which is what I think you did, um, but um, that's always any any ankle I, structures I do, whether it's medial, lateral, um, except for the Achilles, I always start with the anterior talocrural joint because an effusion um, <clears throat> would influence what happens medially, or synovitis what would influence what happens medially. Um, the tibial nerve, you know, you started with the tibial nerve, and my only comment would be. Uh, for those that are just starting out, make sure you start high enough up at the tibial nerve because there's a lot of heterogeneity in the divisions to the medial and lateral plantar nerves that take off of the medial calcaneal nerve and even the inferior branch or Baxter's nerve with the lateral plantar nerve. Um, and I've missed uh, some of these branches before or gotten confused because I didn't start high enough. 
Um, so that would just be one comment is make sure you're starting proximal enough on the tibial nerve as you scan down. So you're not missing uh, an early takeoff of the branch. Um, you know that like you, Brennan, the medial plantar nerve seems to be where the money is as far as pathology when nerves are uh, involved, whereas a lot of plantar nerve seems to be less uh, affected when it turns pathology, but some of the important branches come off the lateral plantar nerve. So both nerves are important that way. Um, Brenner, what did you think was, you know, you, you presented in your, um, in your history and physical that she had a too many toes signs, so she had insufficiency. What do you think was first? Do you think it was the, the tendon that caused the spring ligament laxity or vice versa that ultimately led to her beginning of insufficiency? Great, <laughs> great question, uh, Doug. You know, I, I always struggle with this in that is it the tendon is elongating uh, and no longer supporting the ankle. So you're putting all this dynamic load on, um, you know, on the spring ligament and then it has kind of that attritional elongation. That would be my suspicion since I didn't see a focal like defect in the spring ligament, like she had an acute ligament tear and then, you know, overload of the tendon. But I, I actually don't know. That's a, that's a great, great question. Um, if you know the answer, I'd, I'd be glad to learn from you. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> um, the only reason I bring it up is, so just kind of focusing on the posterior tibialis tendon, um, you know, I, I find that a really interesting tendon. And, and oftentimes early pathology is not the tendon, it's the tendon sheath. Yeah. And you see this, you know, thickened and vascular tendon sheath, and you're surprised that the tendon itself actually doesn't look that bad. Um, and, you know, we see that a lot. And then it seems like then the progression becomes that the tendon, you know, starts to get involved. And occasionally, you know, we see pathology of the tendon first. So I, I find that very interesting. Um, early pathology, subtle pathology can be challenging. I know the radiologists talk about it. Normally it's twice the size of the, you know, adjacent FDL. So that's yeah. one possible, but, you know, we have the option of comparison views. And yeah. so that's what I do is, is I make sure that I'm getting very, you know, careful comparison views. And you had mentioned that the FDL is over the sustenacular tali. So that's a nice landmark to make sure that you're exactly on the same transverse cut when doing comparison views, when you, when you see the FDL over the sustentaculi. So that's a little trick I use sometimes when I'm looking at comparative views of defined subtle pathology. Yeah. Uh, Doug, when you were commenting on the early pathology, so this individual that has that complete rupture is like a young, healthy uh, man. And he actually came in about nine months before and he had a normal appearing tendon, but had tenosynovitis. And uh, he was treated conservatively. He ultimately decided that, you know, he was having some pain. So he wanted to uh, come in and, and be reevaluated. And he had a full thickness, you know, rupture of that tendon without any trauma. And so over a course of several months, you know, I have a pre and post imaging of this tenosynovitis to complete rupture um, without trauma. Wow. And so I assume there is some real significant inflammatory pathology going on there. Yeah, yeah. So the other thing is, is probably a little bit debatable would be what I do. So I would argue a little bit, Brennan, that on, when you had that proximal to distal sweep of the posterior tibialis tendon, there was one little focal area and you showed that on long axis where I would actually argue the tendon is focally thin. Um, there's just a lot of tear in there, but I would argue that is focally thin. And, and so I will sometimes put in my report, if I see focal thinning of the tendon, that that's a sign of insufficiency. Um, and because surgeons want to know that, they want to know if you're getting signs of uh, insufficiency, um, that's probably time to intervene from an operative point of view to prevent complete rupture, which then becomes hard. So um, that's just one of the things I think that would be debatable, whether one, we can accurately say that's a sign of insufficiency, and two is, you know, do, do we report that in an imaging report? But I do sometimes, if I see clear focal insufficiency or thinning of the tendon, I report that as insufficiency. Yeah, Doug, can I ask you one more question? What do you do, um, you know, as far as like dynamic testing of the spring ligament, do you find that like the talus dropping is a reliable 
finding I, something I, you know, as I was looking at this case, um, you know, when I, when I scanned this lady, I was kind of thinking about and trying to, you know, sort through in my head, like, how do I decide if this is truly insufficient versus just normal stress? Yeah, I don't know if I have an answer for that either, because I, I will also see that same laxity, but I see it not too uncommonly when someone has or tends towards a plan is foot alignment. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know if that is actually where this person lives or if that's an actually an acquired laxity. And I, I think that's a great question. Hey, Brennan, I think for everybody on the, on the, on the talk, do you just want to comment quickly on your technique for stressing spring ligament? Yeah, so I essentially, um, what, I, what I more or less try and do is I put my transducer, it's not on the plantar aspect and it's not on the medial, it's kind of somewhat oblique between the two. Um, it's like a kind of coronal slash sagittal uh, plane in reference to the long axis of the foot. And, um, and what I'll do is I'll essentially try and lock their calcaneus um, with my, uh, my transducer hand if I can, or I'll have someone else do it. And then I will take my other hand and I'll, I'll essentially put them into like a four foot abduction. So similar uh, to the mechanism that when someone has um, some like uh, talonavicular um, uh, alignment abnormalities, kind of how that, that talus is, or the navicular is going to slide laterally refer in reference to the talus. I'll try and kind of put them in that four foot abduction um, while I'm scanning the ligament. And it is, it can be a challenging uh, thing to scan if you can't get their hind foot locked in nicely. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. That's, that's super helpful. And it's just interesting in your video. I mean, that, that ligament looked incredibly lax. I mean, the amount of motion that you were able to put through that ligament was, was, was quite impressive. Um, are any, uh, any other comments, Brendan or Doug, before we wrap? Oh, great job. And, a, a pretty common problem, but um, not a not necessarily a, a easy problem. These are tough, and and I think the ultrasound, um, you know, the resolution is just fantastic, and in a sense, better than MR. Yeah, thanks so much, guys. Yeah, yeah thanks, Brennan. That was that was excellent, as expected, and as as always, I learned probably 10 different things from you today. So thanks for doing that. Um, and thanks everybody for hopping on. We, uh, we will call that there. Um, we're off next week. Drew Duerson will be uh, giving a talk on the 16th uh, case of ischiofemoral impingement. Otherwise, until then, um, happy Friday, happy weekend, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you guys soon.